Okay, I think we are going to get started. Um, I have everybody muted except for uh, we got maybe one more person who's just who's in the process of joining. Uh, but I think we'll get started. Um, I've got everybody muted except myself and, and Eileen um, for the time being. And uh, uh, well, first of all, I just want to welcome everybody to our Lime Forest Block uh, Habitat Assessment Info Session this morning. My name is Corey Folsom O'Keefe, and I'm the Director of Bird Conservation for Audubon, Connecticut. And uh, I've just got a few slides to get us started, and then I'll be passing the, the mic uh, to Eileen, and then to Hugh, and then to Kelly, and then we'll come back to me. But uh, So just a little bit about the Lion Forest Block Conservation Project. Um, this is a project that started in 2018 and uh, takes place in the Lion Forest Block Important Bird Area, which includes the towns of uh, Colchester, East Haddam, Lyme, Old Lyme, East Lyme and Salem. And then give me just a second here to mute everybody. Okay. And um, the IBA is an important area for wood thrush and cerulean warbler and a variety of other woodland nesting birds. And uh, over the last year and a half, um, we've had a lot of presentations, bird walks, workshops, and demonstrations uh, within the IBA. Uh, to engage people, um, actually about hundred, hundreds of people have, have sort of participated um, and learned about the IBA, the birds that live there, um, their habitats, and what uh, they can do to improve habitat for birds in their own backyards and at local preserves. Uh, for uh, 2020, we're into the, the second phase of the project, and uh, as part of the project, we're going to be offering habitat assessments to private landowners. Uh, and that's why most of you have turned, tuned in today to learn a little bit more about uh, what a habitat assessment entails. And then we have volunteers who are, who are joining us as well um, who will be helping with the project. So this morning, um, you'll be hearing from uh, Eileen Fielding, who's the director of Audubon Sharon and leads Audubon's Working Lands Initiative about why managing, why manage woodlands for birds and also some of the basic principles. Then uh, we'll be, Switching screens and Hugh Odelig, one of our Lime Forest Block assistants, will walk us through the Birders Dozen, which is a subset of bird species that can be found across Connecticut uh, that sort of are representative of the, the diversity of bird species that can be found in our woodlands. And uh, Hugh's presentation is, is particularly exciting because the birds that he's going to be talking about are going to be arriving in Connecticut over the next month or so. Uh, we are right at the beginning of spring migration and um, very soon our, our woodlands are going to be flooded with a, a whole variety of birds. Uh, after Hugh's presentation, we will take a 10 minute break so that folks can maybe get a second cup of coffee, uh, use the bathroom. We'll also use that time to ask questions. And uh, then uh, when we return, Kelly Morgan, who's also a Lion Forest Block assistant, will dive a little deeper into habitat assessments, what they entail, when they will take place, and who's involved. And then lastly, I'll be taking everyone on a virtual habitat assessment of the Mine Hill Preserve, which is located in Roxbury, Connecticut. So just a few more things before I pass the mic to Eileen. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, uh, as we've mentioned, there is a chat box at the bottom of your screen, or uh, there's a symbol at the bottom of the screen for the chat box. And when you click on that, the chat box will open up and uh, you can ask questions there. Um, and then we'll also take questions during the 10 minute break and at the end of the presentation. And uh, the last thing I wanted to do is just thank all of our partners and supporters. Um, the Lime Forest Black Conservation Project um, has a lot of support, a lot of help from uh, area land trusts, um, local towns, the Eight Mile, Wild, Eight Mile River Wild and Scenic Coordinating Committee, um, Fruchi and Wiliki LLC, uh, Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center. So we've got a lot of partners that are helping make, helping make this project possible. And I just wanted to give a shout out to them. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Eileen. Well, thank you, Corey. I just want to mention uh, in advance here, uh, since we're all doing this from home and uh, we have varying strengths of internet connection, I have been known to lose my connection. Um, that's why Corey is the one who's jockeying the slides for this presentation. So if for some reason I disappear, 
you won't lose the slide program. And, and I'm sure Corey will be able to wing it through the slides on, on, until I get back on. So uh, please don't be too disconcerted by that if it happens. Uh, but anyway, uh, welcome again to the presentation. As the uh, team leader for Eastern Forests for, uh, for Audubon in Connecticut, uh, I have been working with landowners and with foresters uh, to do bird habitat assessments on, on various properties. And uh, there's a good reason that Audubon chooses to do this. Um, let's go uh, to the next slide here. Um, Audubon has a working lands initiative that's nationwide. Because if you uh, take a look at who owns land, uh, a, gr a great deal of it is working land. So we collaborate with landowners, land managers, government agencies, private industry across the hemisphere to increase the quality of habitat on privately managed lands. Uh, in the next slide, let's take a look at uh, who owns the forest in Connecticut. Next slide. Trying. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, um, this is the, the story in Connecticut. Uh, these data are from 2004, but the, the general picture is still the same. Um, uh, more than half of the forest is in parcels that are less than 100 acres and about 80% privately owned. So the message is pretty clear, especially in the eastern half of the United States where a lot of our forest birds are. If uh, you're going to try to conserve forest birds, all the reserves, all the land trust properties, all the parks, all the wildlife sanctuaries put together are not really going to give you the most effective bird conservation. What will be most effective is if private landowners are also on board with um, knowing what will enhance their, uh, their land as bird habitat. And that can uh, help us ensure the survival and reproductive success of some of these birds. So uh, in the next slide, <laughs> there we go. There are a number of ways that uh, we, we put birds in the picture. Uh, Connecticut has a number of important bird areas and Corey can tell you lots more about that. And those are areas that are particularly remarkable for concentrations of birds or diversity of bird species. We also uh, identified Connecticut priority birds. These are birds uh, that uh, are in decline, although <laughs> at this point, a, a great many more birds are in decline than uh, just the list of Connecticut priority birds, but uh, they tend to be the ones that uh, we might pay the most attention to in trying to pick a, uh, a piece of the landscape that we want to really focus on as a conservation priority. We also have forest focal areas. And uh, these are areas where uh, there may be a particularly good quality forest habitat in the sense that there's a lot of contiguous forest. It's uh, a fairly, uh, fairly large area. And in doing all these things uh, with a bird focus, uh, we find that improving the habitat for the birds usually has benefits for a lot of other wildlife. It's related to the overall health of the forest, and of course it has benefits for uh, keeping water clean. Um, so it's, it's a watershed health issue as well. So um, that's us focusing on birds, but what about the private landowners? People don't necessarily own land just to conserve birds. So uh, working with landowners on, on uh, bird habitat preservation has to be integrated with what the private landowners actually value about their land. We'll talk, uh, talk about that a little bit more later. So in the next slide, we will um, take a look at uh, some of the forest focal areas. Um, most of them are not in urban uh, spaces and I'm just, because of what's going on right now with the pandemic, I'm struck by how this is almost the inverse of um, the, the map that's showing where COVID-19 is getting a foothold in Connecticut. <laughs> but we'll leave that behind for now. Um, the criteria um, are large forested blocks and the adjacent lands. 
and again, you know, some of the large forested blocks tend to be uh, state forests, um, forests owned by uh, water utilities, forests owned by land trusts, uh, but the adjacent lands are also important, and so are the lands in between that connect these forest focal areas. And that's a major focus of uh, programs like Housatonic Valley Association's Follow the Forest Initiative or in the western part of the state to try and establish connections between these forest focal areas. So um, let's talk a little bit in the next slide about why we're concerned about forest birds. Uh, why all this effort? Well, if you take a look at uh, where, the, where the red spots are on this map of the continental US, uh, New England, northern Michigan, um, the northern Midwest, but, but look especially at the east and the northeast there. We have some of the highest species diversity and density of breeding birds in the continental US. Now those aren't all year round residents because we have a huge number of neotropical migrants who winter elsewhere, but then come flooding into the Northeast in, uh, in spring and summer because this is the, uh, the chosen breeding habitat for them. So uh, in the next slide, uh, we feel that we have a big responsibility here. Um, not only do we have a lot of birds uh, coming up and breeding in this area, but those birds are gonna be under stress. Uh, climate change is predicting that uh, their ranges are going to shift. Some, some birds that now breed further south might be coming into New England. Our birds may be uh, uh, establishing breeding ter territories for farther north. Uh, it's gonna be a time of adjustment and that's only one of the stresses that's on these uh, neotropical migrants and on our, uh, our year round species. So just to go through some examples of the sort of declines we're seeing over the past 50 years, um, the Canada warbler uh, is, has gone down about 31% in the last 50 years. And what we're, we're talking about here is breeding bird survey data that have been taken uh, annually over the past 50 years. Um, another one that a lot of people already know about is the wood thrush on the next slide. Uh, you might have to click a couple more times, Corey for everything on this slide to come up, thanks. <laughs> um, it's one of the 41% of the neotropical migratory songbirds uh, that are declining. And everybody loves the wood thrush. It's a beautiful bird, it has a beautiful song. A lot of us really associate it with uh, you know, some of our happiest times in the woods and it has gone down 55% over the past 50 years, um, which is not a good trend. Uh, yellow-billed cuckoo. Um, now, actually, we have a, we can hear the yellow-billed cuckoo, right? Can we hear it? You getting a sound there? Uh, let me play it again because I was muted. So. Um. Oh, all right. <laughs> now we may have to do without the songs. Do you hear it, Eileen? I don't hear it. Okay. Um, uh, that might be because my sound is turned right down. Nope. Is anybody else hearing the yellow-billed cuckoo? No, but you might want to go to the speaker to the far end of that slide. Of um, Yeah, it should be turned all the way up. Yep. Try it one mm. more time. One more time. We won't spend too much time on this. Now yeah. it's turned all okay. the way up. All right, we're out of luck. Uh, I think it, it, it might be just uh, my, the, the speakers on my computer don't work, so I'm listening through headphones, and so I can hear it, but I think unfortunately nobody else can. But so it's a good thing the birding section that is being done by Hugh on his computer. So we know that works because we tried it yesterday. Okay, great. I will not attempt a yellow-billed cuckoo for you folks. Uh, we'll, we'll just let it go. <laughs> um, another species is the rose-breasted grosbeak, down about 35%. And, um, and then there's the, uh, what's the next one coming up? There's a cerulean warbler. Um, the cerulean is kind of scary because um, it's down about 74% if you consider its entire breeding range. I'm happy to say that in Connecticut, it's not doing anywhere near that badly. But still, you know, here's one of these birds uh, who's losing major chunks of its range to the south of us, or at least uh, major chunks of quality uh, breeding range to the south of us. 
So it, again, it's really important that we make sure that the breeding habitat for our neotropical migrants uh, here in New England is as good as it can possibly be. Okay, so how do we do that? In the next slide, we'll just run down the list of the sort of things that you'd need to uh, provide for these birds. They all need cover. Um, that's for hiding from predators. It's also from sheltering uh, from inclement weather. They all need food. And they don't always need the same food, depending on what time of the year it is and what they're doing. So uh, they, they're going to need a supply of food that is constant during the, the whole time they're here. So if one, one source disappears, another one might become available. Um, they're gonna need nest sites. And birds can be amazingly specific about what kind of site is proper. A horizontal branch, a forked branch, a tussock of grass. They're very specific about where they will nest. That said, they don't all read the bird books and some of them nest in some pretty strange, um, unusual places that you wouldn't expect them. But in general, uh, they're specific about their nest sites. And uh, they, they're going to need certain aspects in their territories. Now that's uh, for the birds that are uh, staying here to breed, but um, birds also have specific requirements for making it through migration. The birds that we're seeing right now, for example, uh, might not be birds that are gonna be uh, breeding in Connecticut. They're on their way from the Neotropics up to Canada, but they need a set of stopovers so that they can drop down to the ground during the day, rest, feed, and then take off again at night to do more traveling. If they can't find good stopovers, that can really seriously affect their uh, survival on migration. And of course, they need wintering habitat. And uh, for us, that, uh, that applies to the year-round birds. Okay, and the next slide. Uh, here we go. Uh, Audubon, Connecticut has identified about 90 priority bird species. Um, those are birds uh, for, of what we call significant conservation need. In other words, uh, their, their uh, populations are declining. And for which our actions over time can lead to measurable improvements in status. Just think about some of these birds. They face a lot of stresses in their annual cycle. Some of them may be uh, encountering poor quality wintering habitat. Some of them may be losing migration stopovers. There's not a lot that a landowner in Connecticut can do about that, aside from supporting Audubon, but um, what we can do is just make sure that when they do get to their breeding habitat, it's as good as it can be so that they have the best chance of uh, successfully reproducing. And that might help offset losses that they're getting uh, in other places. So among the priority bird species, uh, or actually in some cases separate from the uh, bird, uh, priority bird species, we have focal bird species. And that's what the birders dozen is, is really all about. If you're going to ask private landowners to help out with bird habitat enhancement, you don't want to uh, start out with just too much to learn. There are a lot of birds out there and have a lot of different uh, habitat requirements, but you wanna narrow it down to some species that are fairly simple to identify and Altogether, the set of focal birds use a wide range of forest types. So if, if you're making those birds happy, you are probably uh, protecting a, quite a variety of different types of habitat in the forest. And if you manage the forest in particular ways, you have use common silvicultural practices, they're likely to have an effect on the success of these birds. And uh, here's the key. These focal birds occur with other bird species that use similar habitat. They're not identical habitats, but they are similar. So if you manage for the focal birds, you're going to be doing good for a lot of other birds as well. That's the logic. So here on the next slide are the birders dozen. Um, and uh, with a rhetorical question at the bottom. <laughs> if no species have exactly the same needs, can you manage for all of them? Well, no, not exactly. But the birders dozen that Hugh is gonna be talking about in, in more detail uh, in a few minutes um, are kind of representative 
of a lot of different habitats. So if you get to know those and where they live, you probably can benefit uh, a lot of other birds. So uh, let's, let's talk about having a piece of forested land. You don't necessarily, you weren't necessarily thinking just of birds um, uh, being a landowner. Uh, what are the other reasons? We talk uh, in our workshops and, and our seminars uh, with people who are involved with forested land in, in various ways. Sometimes we do workshops for foresters, sometimes we do workshops for land trusts, and sometimes we do workshops for landowners. So pe the people's reasons for having land uh, really vary quite a bit. They might be looking for uh, commercial products, they might be looking for, we like to think of birds, or at least sometimes I like to talk about birds as a forest product. That's a legitimate forest product, <laughs> is birds. Uh, or general wildlife habitat. Uh, overall biodiversity, including uh, things that we don't usually consider wildlife, things like fungi and soil invertebrates and things like that. But forests that are in good condition are also resilient to catastrophes things like uh, serious insect pest infestations, droughts, microbursts, ice storms, floods. Um, if the forest is in good shape, it can recover uh, relatively readily uh, from catastrophes. And then of course, if you have uh, a stream in your forest or you're uphill from a stream, which most of us are, a healthy forest can uh, filter water and protect water quality. And then you can uh, get off into some uh, more esoteric aspects of ecosystem health and ecosystem services. So, uh, you know, people love their land for, for different reasons. And um, our approach here is that uh, enhancing bird habitat can factor into enhancing some of these other things as well. So on the next slide, um, we'll talk about uh, how we actually go about doing this. Uh, the first question is, well, you know, what do you have on your land? Um, so you do a survey, you do some sort of an, an assessment, which is uh, what this uh, webinar is all about. Uh, the fun part is that you get to go out and learn what birds are in your woods. And time and time again, uh, people are uh, surprised by the birds that, that live in the woods. Uh, before the webinar started, we were talking about um, all the ways you can, uh, you can actually miss what birds are there because, uh, you know, if they stop singing by eight in the morning and, and uh, you don't have a chance to get out on your own land by that time, uh, you might be astonished at, at what's there singing in the breeding season. Uh, and that's, it's really fun to uh, find out that you have a greater variety of birds in your woods than you, you might have known. And, and this is with apologies to any of the hardcore birders that are in this webinar who absolutely know exactly what's on their property. <laughs> um, but going out in the woods, you can also identify strengths. And by that, I mean, you can take a look at uh, a stream side and say, wow, you have really great Louisiana water thrush habitat here or look at an overgrown field and say, wow, you know, the chestnut-sided warblers would really love this. So where do you already have good habitat for birds? You know, do you have a, a really nice canopy that's something like this scarlet tanager that uh, would like to inhabit? So uh, then um, you can take a look at where you could tweak your property a little bit that might make it better for a particular species. Uh, would an owl box on a tree um, possibly make it, uh, poss make it easier for screech owls to inhabit uh, a piece of land that otherwise would support them well? You know, maybe a, a nest cavity is the only thing missing that would keep a species from using your property. So you put up bird boxes, uh, girdle some trees uh, so that you have more dead trees with cavities. Um, just identify possible improvements like that. And then uh, work with a professional. We, we often, almost always actually, uh, bring in a professional forester uh, to, to give the real advice about forest management. Okay, I'm going in the next slide, I'm going to start uh, talking about some things that you're gonna see in, 
in more real life detail uh, when Corey talks about what it's like to uh, do a forest habitat assessment on your property. So we'll, we'll go through it here fairly quickly. Um, when you're managing for birds, uh, you have some options here. One thing that we're short of in Connecticut is truly old forest. And there's not much you can do about that besides leave the forest alone and wait a long time. But that doesn't mean we can't create some of the features of older forest in middle age forest. We have a lot of forest that is fairly uniform in age, meaning that uh, all the trees are close to the same age instead of some young, some a little older, some middle aged and, and some really old. So um, if you have a forest like that, what you might do is create some gaps, create some snags, that would be more characteristic of older forest. And those are bird habitat features. And there's also a shortage of really young forest in Connecticut. So depending on the context, you might want to think about converting a little bit of woods back to young forest so we don't completely lose our, uh, what we call our early successional forest species. But then there are birds who need large tracts of interior forest. So if what you have is a fairly sizable piece of interior forest, or if what you and several of your neighbors have together adds up to a large tract of interior forest, maybe you don't want to be chopping it up. You know, uh, the thing might be to uh, keep some of that interior forest intact so that the birds who need to be deep in the forest have habitat. So overall, the, the goal is to have a greater variety of habitats for more bird species, but it's really important to consider that within the context of the whole landscape, and of course, within the context of why else you have the land. Okay, so moving on, um, here are some of the, the factors that you would weigh. First of all, what species do you want? Um, I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman last summer. Uh, we got onto his property and he said, I want black Bernie and warblers. <laughs> and so he had a very specific um, uh, goal and, uh, and an ambitious one since they usually nest further north from here. But, uh, you know, he was up in the hills and, and had some spruce forest. So it wasn't completely, uh, completely unreasonable. Um, take a look, uh, this, this harks back to something I've already said. Take a look at the habitat, of your va habitat value of your land as is. Uh, it might be great for something, and it might be great for a species that's really high priority. So you might want to leave it the way it is. Um, characteristics of the adjacent land, as, uh, as already mentioned, um, you might find that you've got forest and no young forest, but if your next door neighbor or the land trust next door has some young forest, the birds who use your land might actually be able to disperse into that um, uh, if, if in part of their life cycle, they need young forest. Because some of these birds will patch switch um, or patch trade. They will nest in a particular type of habitat, but then their fledglings need something a little bit different. So for example, a wood thrush may nest in the woods, but then young wood thrushes uh, might get benefit from being in some younger, lower vegetation where it's easier to forage. A uh, big consideration is the risk of invasives. Uh, sometimes that really inhibits doing active management on a property because management uh, can involve a little bit of disturbance of land. And that kind of opens up an invitation for invasive species to get established. So if there are invasive species, especially nearby, you might wanna consider taking care of that first before you do anything. Uh, and overall, what you want is, uh, and this, this is a very broad statement that covers a lot, <laughs> seek the highest and best ecological outcome, which is uh, perhaps a highfalutin way of saying uh, a variety of species, a variety of uh, habitat types that will support a variety of species. Okay, moving on. Um, this is something we're going to be talking about a lot uh, for the, the whole webinar. Physical structure is really important for birds. It's astonishing how many bird species nest at zero to 15 feet 
you know, in the forest. You know, you think of forest birds, they must be up in the trees, right? Well, no, a lot of them are pretty close to the ground. And um, we don't tend to expect that, or some of us don't tend to expect that. And if you look at a forest that is structured like this, there's not a lot there between zero to 15 feet. So if we look at the next slide, uh, what is going on in all these woods in Connecticut? Um, this is not that unusual to walk into a woods and see you know, a little bit of green on the ground, some leaf litter, a little bit of downed wood, and then all these pole-shaped uh, trunks and uh, a canopy and not a lot in between. So in the next slide, we have the, some of the answers to this question. One of the factors that is suppressing structure at zero to 15 feet can be lack of disturbance. The canopy is closed overhead, so the forest floor is very shaded and there's not a lot getting started in that deep shade. You get sunny openings from disturbances, whether it's a, a tree just dying or a tree blowing down or a tree um, being cut you know, for, for one purpose or another, um, a microburst, a gypsy moth infestation. Um, all of those things seem like misfortunes, but they do create sunny openings where new growth can regenerate. Another huge factor in Connecticut is overbrows by deer. Uh, there are uh, whole tracts of forest that are not doing very well reestablishing themselves because all of the tree seedlings uh, get picked off by, uh, by deer browse. So uh, what can we do about this? <laughs> Um, in the next slide, you can see what uh, good nesting uh, habitat is for those species that need to nest at zero to 15 feet. We're looking for dense undergrowth um, close to the forest floor and also a dense midstory in between the forest floor uh, and the uh, any canopy overhead. We prefer it to be native species, although it isn't always. And I should point out here, the whole forest doesn't have to look like this. I think a lot of people who have uh, forested land really love the park-like aspect of, you know, being able to see through these galleries of tree trunks and, you know, it's, it's lovely. And you don't have to give that up entirely and scandalize your neighbors um, having a landscape that looks entirely like this but you do need some patches of this at least. Okay, in the next slide. Um, here's another thing that uh, sometimes is considered a negative on property, but from the point of view of bird habitat, it's definitely a positive. You don't want standing dead trees, also known as snags, where they're going to be a hazard to people. You don't want them next to trails or hanging over houses or anything like that, but where they're safe, they're a really important part of bird habitat uh, in the eastern forest. They provide food because they're infested with insects. Um, they provide uh, several kinds of shelter. And the most obvious is that, you know, if they're hollowed out, they provide cavities for nesting. Okay, can we move on to the next slide? Um, coarse and fine woody material and leaf litter. A coarse woody material um, is generally considered uh, dead wood that's four inches in diameter or greater. Uh, and fine woody material is the smaller stuff, if you're interested in the technicalities. Um, that provides cover for birds. This is the sort of official organized version of um, cover for birds. This is a deliberately constructed brush pile from slash from taking a couple of trees down big stuff on the bottom, smaller stuff on the top. Um, and you can see that there's a fairly good um, uh, layer of leaf litter on this forest floor. This is a, a sugar bush at the Sharon Audubon Center that uh, we're managing not only for maple syrup, but for bird habitat. And the leaf litter is important too because it's full of invertebrate food. And some of these forest birds are foraging on the forest floor. And if the forest floor is bare, 
um, there's not as much food accessible to them. I always wince a little bit when uh, people think that it's a good idea to sweep all the leaves off of paths in the woods uh, because the leaf litter really does have an important uh, function. Um, the next slide shows uh, sort of the less organized version of coarse and fine woody material. This, this stuff hasn't been gathered into brush piles and this might not actually apply to a lot of the properties that you're thinking about. But uh, this came from a uh, small group selection cut, again, on the Sharon Audubon property. And the dead treetops have been left lying in the woods. And, uh, you know, looks, looks terrible, looks messy. But even though you wouldn't want to walk through that because there are all these trunks and branches and twigs in the way, that's not only uh, creating cover for the birds, uh, it's also allowing seedlings to come up through all of that mess that are not very accessible to the deer. So it's giving the regenerating uh, trees uh, a chance at getting up to a decent height before, uh, before the deer can get at them. Okay, moving on. Another thing that uh, we tend to look for or strive for is what we call soft edges. Over on the left, you see um, fairly bare ground. There's a bare opening there. And over on the right, it's mostly forest-sized trees, especially uh, beyond that slide. <laughs> but you'll see that there's uh, a, a band of thick vegetation that's gradually increasing in height. We sometimes call it the stadium effect. That belt of, uh, of trees and shrubs is what we call a soft edge. Not only is it a form of habitat in itself that some birds preferentially select, it also is kind of a buffer between the completely open area and the forest interior. And that can make a big difference to the birds that are in the forest interior because there are uh, small predators and nest parasites like cowbirds that may be entering the forest from over on the left there uh, that aren't going to be able to see as far in or may not penetrate as far in um, and uh, uh, prey upon or parasitize uh, the nests of the interior birds. And also the interior birds um, don't like to be near edges and um, uh, this buffer keeps them from uh, perceiving that edge as, as quite such a sharp edge. So moving on, um, what I've done here is highlight in red the uh, bird-friendly management measures you might be most likely to take on your property. This is kind of an extensive list and some of it uh, applies to actual timber harvesting um, and uh, forestry for forest products. But you can probably do something to enhance the vertical structure. You know, get, get some more of that stuff growing near the ground and uh, in the, in the mid-story between the ground and the canopy. Of course, try not to do this during the breeding season. Um, think about small gaps, um, small sunny spots where you can get some, some vegetation growing up. Don't be so uh, eager to get all that messy dead wood off of the ground. It's, it's actually habitat. Soften the edges between the habitats. And uh, one, one comment I'll throw in here about softening the edges between habitats. It's very common on a bird habitat assessment to go out and say, oh, what a beautiful soft edge. Look at all those shrubs in between the field and the woods. That's great. And then you look again and you realize a lot of it is invasive species. So uh, let's look at the bottom thing, manage invasives. Okay, so what do you do? If you take all the invasive species out, then you lose your soft edge. That's we say, why we say, well, try to do it in a phased approach. So you don't wanna rip out all the structure um, and leave the birds with nothing, but you know, just keep working at uh, converting from mostly invasive species to not so many invasive species and more native species uh, because the native species actually support the birds better in other ways as well, uh, particularly uh, in uh, the area of uh, furnishing them food. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. I just want to wrap up with um, uh, a quick little run through 
of what can happen in a sunny gap. And this is that same group selection cut that uh, I showed you a few slides ago. So let's um, just skip through these. Again, what a mess. <laughs> but look at that patch of green. Uh, okay, don't look at that patch of green. Yeah, look at that patch of green. <laughs> Sorry, Corey, I'm messing with your mind. Um, if you stand in the middle of that patch of green and look up, that's the next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's a little gap in the canopy. A few trees were taken out. And now the rest of the slides we can just go through fairly quickly. Um, look at what was coming up the following spring. That was a December cut. This is uh, what came up right away the following spring. Uh, you can keep going. Um, we've got Jack in the pulpit. We had trillium coming up. Uh, different kinds of rubus, uh, you know, blackberry, raspberry, um, moose maple, chestnut oak. Lots of chestnut oak came up in this clearing. And oak regeneration is hard to get in Connecticut uh, where there are a lot of deer. Uh, do we have more of those? A couple more? Yeah, I was so enthusiastic about the chestnut oak, I kept photographing it. Uh, but there's also black birch there. Um, more chestnut oak. Uh, and uh, did I take out the tulip tree slide? Yeah, I did. But uh, blueberries and huckleberries uh, were also growing in this clearing. So um, that's where I want to wrap up. And um, Corey, don't know if you want to do a question or two now or just hand right off to Hugh. I think we will hand right off to Hugh. Um, but okay. if you have a question at this point, um, oh, you can uh, send, put it in the chat box and we will get it answered or we'll come back to it um, at the end of Hugh's part of the presentation. So um, with that, I'm going to unmute Hugh and uh, he's going to share his screen or I'm going to okay there we go he's unmuted okay Hugh you are up just jumping back to the beginning of the PowerPoint uh, I think you need to share your screen you can't okay. see it just yet there we go All right, so um, I'm going to be going over the birders dozen. Oh, always have this issue. I'm going to be going over the birders dozen um, identification tips and ecological information for um, twelve priority forest bird species. Uh, the first on the list that I'm going to be going over is the American woodcock, which is mostly nocturnal bird, small and chunky, found primarily in the eastern United States. Um, they have short legs and a short neck with a long straight bill, uh, cinnamon colored underparts and a gray collar with broad and rounded wings. The American woodcock spends most of their time hidden in fields or on the forest floor probing for earthworms. In the spring, males perform courtship flight display, giving their paint, paint call and launching into the air in like almost like a spiraling pattern. Um, they prefer deciduous forests where the trees lose their leaves in the winter time. Um, forest edges, old fields, wet meadows in um, eastern North America. I'll just play the sound now. I don't know, is that loud enough? Yeah, we can hear it. Okay. So um, they nest in the woods in um, open meadows for courtship, and that they're often found near vernal pools or different wet wetland areas in the woods. Oh, and they prefer a dense understory. Yeah, this is one of those species that requires several different kinds of things. Yep. So this is the um, black-throated blue warbler. It's a fairly large, distinctive black and blue warbler with the blue head and beak with a black face and throat. And um, note the white square or handkerchief on the wings. Um, compared to other warblers, they're fairly large. They forage in the understory and lower canopy of forests where they pick insects from the undersides of leaves. Um, males sing to defend breeding ter territory and aggressively 
um, chase away rival males. You gonna hear that guy? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're um, found in larger tracts of deciduous or mixed woodlands with a dense shrubbery understory. Um, they're, they can be associated with um, striped maple or if there's a large number of mountain laurel. So this is the black-throated green warbler. Um, it's a small songbird. Um, of the New World Warblers. It's olive green crown with a yellow face with olive markings. <clears throat> they have a thin pointed bill with white wing bars, olive green back and pale underparts with black streaks on the flanks. Uh, they appear plump and seemingly large headed by proportions. Um, they're active and agile, primarily foraging for small insects hiding in the bases of leaves and tall trees. <laughs> Um, breeding males sing on exposed perches where their bright head is conspicuous. No, I'll play the sound now. One way that I remember this bird's song is I think that it's, uh, it's Frank Sinatra singing, Strangers in the Night. <laughs> So um, they're strongly associated with hemlocks, uh, often found in coniferous and mixed forests in the north and um, deciduous forests in the south. Um, they're migrating birds and frequent any woody habitat when they're in their migratory patterns. Um, they often come down from the canopy to forage on fruiting shrubs. Um, and typically, like I said, typically prefer hemlock forests compared with white pines. Uh, this is the chestnut-sided warbler. Uh, they breed in eastern North America and southern Canada. They're somewhat stocky and stout build for a warbler and often hold tail cocked above their, their body angle, above their wings. Um, breeding males have a yellow crown, a black mask, white cheeks, and chestnut sides. They're a slim warbler with a relatively long tail that often holds raised above body line. And which makes the tail appear longer and by proportion. Uh, they often flit and hop along slender branches, carefully inspecting the undersides of deciduous leaves. I think we lost the sound there, Hugh. Oh, really? Okay. Huh. Should be. It is up all the way. Yeah, I think it didn't play all the way. Oh, okay. Nope, it's just real short. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the thing to note about the chestnut side of Warbler, and it was hard to hear it in the recording, but the the micha at the end of their song is very is very emphatic. Um, so the, the please, 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 there's a lot of Warblers that song, there's song starts with sort of, you know, a series of notes, but the micha at the end of the chestnut side of warbler is the, the most distinctive part. Mm -hmm. That and where you hear them. So uh, they're often found in uh, regenerating deciduous woods. Uh, so look in saplings and shrubs more often than in tall trees. Um, they nest in young deciduous regrowth and other thickets where small trees and shrubs have been regenerating for a few years after a disturbance. Um, this is the eastern wood peewee. It's a small flycatcher from North America, um, medium-sized, olive gray, with um, a peaked head and two wing bars. Um, I'd like to mention also, it's this bird is perched on an invasive species in the picture there, um, Euonymus burning bush. Um, the closed they prefer closed canopy, but with occasional canopy gaps in dead wood called snags. 
Um, they're sit and wait predators that sally out from arboreal perches after insects and return to the same or nearby perch. They are one of the birds that says its name. So they, they actually say pee wee, which makes it a little easier to remember their song. Um, they're most common deciduous forest woodlands, but may be found in any forested habitat. Um, like I said before, they prefer a nearly closed canopy with an open mid-story and snag service foraging perches. Um, this is the Louisiana water thrush, which is actually one of the earliest migrants to return. So we could actually be starting to look for them fairly soon now. Mm -hmm. um, I often see them at my mom's house too, so I, I'm definitely going to be starting to look. They're typically associated with like small streams and small rivers. And uh, they actually often stop singing much sooner than other birds. Uh, they're a large, somewhat plump warbler that looks like a thrush with its long legs and long body and stout bill. They have a light brown back with a white eyebrow stripe that is wider at the rear and a heavily streaked white breast. Um, they forage along woodland streams and um, they nest adjacent to stumps and other woody debris. Uh, they often perch and forage in vegetation on the ground or at water's edge and prefer habitat, habitat with small rivers or streams. So this is the pileated woodpecker. It's a large woodpecker with a striking red crest. It's very, very distinctive to, to see one of these. Um, they're an insectivorous bird and they're in habitat inhabitant of deciduous forests in the eastern North America, um, the Great Lakes and the boreal forests of Canada, and parts of the Pacific coast. They're a large black woodpecker with white stripes on the face continuing down the neck and a red, large red crest and a long chisel-like bill, which is roughly the same length as the head. So the drumming call they make is pretty distinctive. I'll, I, think I'll, that, I think that's included. Um, they require large trees for nesting and roosting cavities and also are, are benefited by the presence of snags. And also they, they do require a large unbroken tract of forest. I also, I did want to mention that the females have a red crest as well, but they don't have the uh, red cheek stripe that you can see in the picture there. I think it, this picture is um, an adult and an immature. Um, this is a scarlet tanager. Um, they're a stocky songbird with a thick blunt tipped bill. Um, breeding males are unmistakable with their bright red bodies and black wings and tails. But uh, the females actually are like an olive green yellow color with, with darker wings and, and darker tail. Um, they have thick rounded bills suitable for catching insects and eating fruit. Um, the head is fairly large and the tail is somewhat short and broad. The chick burr of the scarlet tanager is actually really helpful 
because um, it's it's very distinctive. So um, if you learn that call, um, you actually start to realize that uh, scarlet tanagers are are not an uncommon bird of of deciduous woodlands. Um, you know, especially in the you know late May, early June, uh, you can be walking through their woods and and hear that chick fur, and then if you look up in the canopy and take a few minutes to, to search, you should be able to find one. Yeah, if you know the call and know enough to look up, um, that's, that's really the key to finding them. You'd think that this bird would be very easy to see, but because it's up in the canopy, it's usually the sound that can cue you in to, to uh, cause you to look a little harder in the canopy, and sure enough, there's a bright red bird up there. Yeah, no, this is actually one of my favorite birds. I remember being very, very young and seeing one at my mom's house. And that was one of the first things that made me interested in birds in the first place. <laughs> um, they're primarily insectivorous during the summer, but also eat fruit during migration on the wintering grounds. Um, they spend much of their time skulking among the wide leaves of deciduous trees in the forest canopy, where they are actually very hard to see. Um, they prefer uneven aged deciduous woods with oaks and maples because of the larger leaf size and with a mostly closed canopy. Um, so this is a uh, red-eyed vireo. Um, they actually sing all day long even when most birds are typically not so that's one one way to identify them if they're in, in your area. They're large chunky vireo with a long angular head, thick neck, and a strong long bill with a small but noticeable hook at the tip. Um, the body is stocky and the tail is fairly short. Um, olive green above and clean white below. They have a gray crown and a white eyebrow stripe called a supercilium, bordered above and below by blackish lines. Oh, I, the eye also becomes more red as they age. Um, they require moderate understory vegetation, um, but they, they can forage in deciduous canopies where they can be difficult to find among the green leaves. They move slowly and methodically, scanning the leaves for their preferred prey of caterpillars. Um, large expanses of deciduous forests, particularly trees with large leaves such as maples. Um, this is the Viri, which is a, a member of the thrush family. Um, they're medium-sized with a plump body and round head, fairly long legs, um, uniformly bright cinnamon brown above with indistinct spotting on the chest and pale underparts. They forage on the ground and in logs for invertebrate prey, peering around and then moving a short distance and repeating the process, kind of similar to like how a robin um, they have a beautiful downward spiraling song, which they often give in late spring and summer, especially at dusk and dawn. Oh, and then they also give uh, an emphatic fear call, which is almost like a scolding call. Um, they prefer deciduous woods with a moderately closed canopy in a dense understory. Um, they use the woody debris for nest sites and shelter and are often found in riparian areas. Uh, so they, they prefer kind of wetter woodlands in that they're a ground nester and typically would be found in like lowlanded wetland habitats. This is the worm-eating warbler. It's a small songbird with a buffy head and underparts. Um, they have a black crown, black crown stripes and a stripe through the eye. 
Um, they're a ground nesting bird, uh, typically preferring hillsides and slopes. So as compared with the um, with the uh, the viri I just mentioned, which would be found in the low wetlanded areas. So found on slopes with mature deciduous or mixed trees and prefer a closed canopy with a dense shrubby understory. Um, they breed in the eastern United States and but they migrate to southern Mexico and Central America for winter. And like I said, they prefer kind of steep slopes in mature hardwood forests. Uh, this is the wood thrush. It's a brown back, heavily spotted on the white breast, a large thrush, which is a little bit smaller than an American robin. Yeah, hear, hearing this call just reminds me of being at my mom's house. <laughs> Um, their ground foraging, they uh, prefer insects and earthworms associated with leaf litter typically. Um, they're a pot-bellied thrush with a short tail and upright posture, uh, kind of like a robin. Um, reddish brown above with white and bold blackish spots below. So they prefer deciduous or mixed woods with a closed canopy and moderate mid-story and shrub layer. Like a fairly open forest floor with a damp soil where they can find the earthworms and insects that they eat. I think that's it. Okay, so um, we're gonna take a 10 minute break in case anybody needs to get a refill on coffee or just wants to get up and, and stretch their legs. Um, but we can also take this, this time to answer any questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and un unmute everybody, but just be conscious there is um, about 25 of us on the phone, so we don't wanna be talking over each other. So just wait for a nice little gap, and then if you have a question, um, you can go ahead and ask it. So let me just uh, pull up the, the participants, and I'll just unmute everybody. I'm just gonna unmute us all. What does that mean? She can hear us. Yeah. Okay, so I think the bulk of people or I'm hitting the unmute button. Uh, so, but you can also unmute yourself. So if you do have a question, go ahead and, and you can unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Yeah, there are a lot of participants that are still muted, uh, possibly because they muted themselves. I think that's probably true. Yeah, okay. So yeah, it's 10, um, 34 right now. So we'll get started again at 10, 44. So uh, maybe just to, to fill the silence a little bit, um, you know, as I mentioned, it is the beginning of spring migration and uh, there are definitely birds that are starting to, to move in or move through Connecticut. I've been out just sort of walking around my neighborhood this week and uh, one morning I think I had, you know, like 20, 25 song sparrows, um, you know, in two big groups and, you know, when we're a normal walk, I might have somewhere between five and ten. So uh, song sparrows are a bird that we see around, but right now they're, they're pushing northwards. So some of the ones that maybe uh, breed uh, more to our north or sort of, you know, had gone south and they're moving back north again. I also had uh, my first pine warbler of the year, my first ruby crown kinglet of the year, my first, first uh, golden crown kinglet of the year. Um, you know, so those are some of the, the early migrants, eastern Phoebes as well, which uh, say, Phoebe, Phoebe, they are moving through in, in good numbers right now. So lots of, lots of activity uh, 
when you're outdoors, um, maybe sort of getting out of the house for a little bit. Yeah, Corey, you're down at the southern side of the state, and uh, we're up in the northern hills here. We've already had uh, golden crown kick, and Louisiana water thrush is coming through. And like I was saying uh, before the webinar, I might have heard an Oriole this morning, but I still can do that because it's so early. So I'll try and get out and get the Cool. Yeah, I had a, um, one of the birds, the first bird Hugh talked about, American woodcock. Um, I had one of those um, probably about two weeks ago now. I was uh, out in my yard at dusk and all of a sudden I heard the, the sort of trilling of a woodcock as it is sort of ascending up into the air for, as part of its courtship display. And I was like, oh my goodness, a woodcock, woohoo! It was, uh, it, was, it, was uh, nice, it was really nice to hear one. And then uh, a few days later I was out uh, listening for owls at a particular spot and there were two or three woodcocks that were actively displayed. Yeah. Um, or do you think you can mute Bob? <laughs> I can, yes. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Sounds like he's got a lot of company right now. Yeah, yeah, really, as, as many of us do. So it, um, that's, uh, that's kind of a nice point to bring up about the woodcock because these, these cool April nights uh, people might be able to see them uh, and hear them. At least hear them. I, mean, I find they can be so hard to see. Uh, the woodcock do their displaying um, out in the open on the edge of a, a field, but they don't really start until it's pretty dark out. So um, there'll still be some light in the sky, but more so you hear the paint, paint, yeah. paint, and then as they're, they're flying up into the sky, you hear like And then as they fall back down to the ground, it's like <laughs> So um, there's my woodcock imitation. With, with you, who needs the woodcock? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, I, I always, I, I don't know that I've ever had a really great look at a woodcock because, you know, most of the time I have observed them, it is, you know, more listening to them and hearing them do their display uh, than it is actually seeing them. But um, well, every, every now and then they'll do something really crazy, like land right in front of you on open ground and start doing a courtship display. I, I had some uh, a woodcock do that uh, on a brick sidewalk uh, one time, uh, just a few feet in front of me. So uh, that woodcock was motivated. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I've heard other stories uh, like that too. So every now and then you can get lucky, uh, but it's usually the woodcock's doing, not your own. Cool. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm going to step away from the computer for just a minute, but uh, I will be back. Okay. And meanwhile, uh, just to let everybody know, the chat box still works. So if there are any uh, comments or questions you wanted to uh, pop into the chat box, we'd be happy to respond uh, with type as well. One of the things, uh, Hugh, when you were talking, um, when you go through the birders dozen like that, it becomes fairly clear what a wide range of habitats are covered by the, uh, by the birders dozen. I mean, in, in one sense, it sounds like, yeah, 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 they all need a closed canopy and dense undergrowth or dense understory. But then if you really think about it, you know, we've got the ones that need the conifers, we've got the ones that need the snags, we've got the ones that need the wetlands and the streams, we've got the ones that need the, um, uh, the, the very young forest. And uh, we've got the ones that need the gaps in the canopies. And so, yeah, really, if you've taken care of those dozen birds, you've got a heck of a forest. <laughs> you know, we've got a really good habitat. And another thing that I hope we get into, um, if, if not on this webinar in detail, on subsequent ones, uh, uh, what kinds of food supplies uh, all of these uh, different native plants are providing over the season because um, it's not just seeds and berries and uh, nectar and pollen and buds. It's also, to a huge extent, it's the insects and, and 
uh, insect food from native plants is far more abundant and available than any insects that are living on <clears throat> non-native plants. Okay, so in about three more minutes, we'll, we'll get started again, so. Mm -hmm. You know, Corey, I was just commenting um, because I don't usually get to listen to the rundown of the Birders Dozen. Mm -hmm. uh, how well it really covers such a wide variety of forest habitats. Nice. Yeah, kind of going over it just makes me excited. I'm like, yeah, I, I love spring migration. I'm just like, yeah. oh, I can't wait to hear a Louisiana water thrush. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. I, I, I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, you know, you, as as we get as we get you know through April and into May, just the the number of birds that you can see in Connecticut and the the, uh, the amount the songs you can hear just it just grows every week and. Um, yeah. I'm an excitable person and, and I just get really excited in the spring. <laughs> how about, um, I put it in the chat, but we seem to have cowbirds, aren't they lovely? Um, but how much damage do they do and is it best to discourage them? Is there a safe way to do that? Hmm. Um, so definitely, I mean, so cowbirds are nest parents, right? So they will lay their egg uh, in the nest of another bird species and they evolved this sort of strategy because they originally used to follow the buffalo herds and they would, you know, they, they had to follow the buffalo herds. They, they couldn't sort of stop and nest. So they would lay their egg in the nest of, a, of another bird so they could continue to follow the buffalo herds and then the other birds would raise their young. And, um, you know, some species, I guess, don't tolerate that and um, like eject the eggs. And so the cowbirds have sort of learned not to, to nest in the, you know, lay an egg in those bird species nests. Like, American robin, for example, I've, I've found hundreds of robin's nests over the years, and they, uh, there's never a cowbird egg in a robin nest. Uh, but then there are species that, um, you know, with the, the cowbird has sort of found will, will accept their eggs rather fairly easily. And there's a number of warbler species that uh, cowbirds will lay their eggs in the nest, and um, what happens is the, the cowbird chicks uh, sometimes hatch before the, they either hatch or be around the same time, sometimes a little bit before the the chips, the chicks that are actually of that, that particular bird. And then they're also, they uh, kind of compete for whatever um, food the, the parent is bringing to the nestlings and the cowbirds can often sort of dominate in the nest. And uh, you might not have, some, you might have, you know, fewer chicks that were actually from the nest actually getting to fledging, or you might have um, just the cowbird chick getting to fledging. So uh, they can have a, a pretty big impact. Uh, they are typically more found around uh, suburban neighborhoods, uh, fields, forest edges. So as you get farther into a forest or a woodland, they sort of become less of a problem. Um, you know, so that's kind of one reason why, um, you know, for to kind of one of our recommendations is to maintain intact forests, because if you have these larger forest areas, then the, the interiors are typically going to be free of cowbirds. Hey, Corey. Yes. I thought I would um, say a little bit about eBird really quick before I start um, talking about the habitat assessments. Sounds good. And uh, actually, it is 1045, so we should get started again, and you can uh, start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and do that. Hi everybody, thank you for joining us today. Um, before I get into this, I, I thought I would um, share a little bit about something that I do every day kind of as a normalcy. We don't have much normal going on right now and something that I do every day, even if it's just for 20 minutes, 
um, I have a, a local park about a quarter of a mile away from my house and I go up there and take a few minutes and do some bird watching. Um, and I don't know if you all know about the eBird app, but it's an app you can download on your phone and any birds that you see, you just enter the information in there. Um, you enter when, where, and how you did the birding. Um, and then you fill out a checklist of all the birds that you saw and heard during the outing. Um, reporting through eBird, I think it makes more conscious birders become they could become aware of what the birds are doing, not just what birds you're seeing, but what they're actually doing. Um, they're, if they're building a nest or are they uh, carrying a caterpillar to a nest, so is it an active nest with, with young in it? Um, so it, to me, it's, it's exciting and it's a bit of normalcy. Also right now with social distancing, we're all looking for uh, ways to connect and eBird is the world's largest biodiversity related citizen science project. And there's more than 100 million bird sightings contributed to eBird each year by birders all around the world. So to me, that's a, a great way that we can connect right now. And also with the fears and uncertainties, we want to do something meaningful and something helpful. So the eBird data that's collected, um, it, it is used by, for hundreds of conservation decisions and it helps uh, inform bird research worldwide, which is pretty awesome and meaningful. So if you haven't already, go ahead and download that, that eBird app. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> One little quick thing I'll add to that is, um, you know, when we were looking to identify um, uh, forest uh, important bird areas, uh, we actually went to eBird to, you know, sort of see what information was available on, say, the distribution of cerulean warblers across the state, um, where you know, wood thrush were plentiful, where other bird species were plentiful. And, um, you know, we were able to actually use eBird data to identify um, and recognize the, the lime forest block as an important bird area. So that's just one of the examples of, of how it can be used. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what a habitat assessment is. Um, so it's an inventory of current songbirds and forest habitat conditions on your property, and they will be conducted by Audubon trained volunteers. We will be training our volunteers this spring and we'll be doing the habitat assessments late summer, early fall. We were planning on doing the assessments earlier, as you know, but with the threat of COVID-19, we needed to push them back a bit. Uh, Audubon staff and a certified forester will be training the volunteers with a series of webinars this spring and Later this summer, when the threat of the virus is settled down, volunteers will have the opportunity for additional training by walking the land trust properties and identifying characteristics on those properties. We so far have a really good number of volunteers signed up and we are so excited because our volunteer list includes master gardeners, environmental college students, lifetime birders, um, we've got landscape designers, land trust members, and environmental educators. Uh, our volunteers, uh, we, we, we think that they are truly champions of birds and other wildlife, and we're so excited to have them as part of our team. So I just wanted to share with you, because you're going to have people coming on, their volunteers coming on your property that you love. Well, these volunteers love, love the environment also, and they're... Um, I think um, we, are, we are so proud to have this group of people that can uh, do these habitat assessments. Um, and Hugh and I, uh, later this fall, Hugh and I will be writing up the reports for the landowners using the information provided by the volunteers. And we will send them out to the landowners later this fall. Some of the things that uh, we will be teaching the volunteers about, um, they will have training on lots of different topics and these are just a few of them. Bird species identification, the birders dozen which Hugh just told us about, tree and shrub identification, 
an invasive plant identification. They'll be learning about horizontal and vertical diversity, canopy gaps, hard and soft edges, values of snags, berries and seed producing plants, and a lot about which, which trees um, associate with uh, the insects that associate most with our native plants. We'll be saving all of this teaching material online and we're recording our web webinars. So the volunteers um, and even the landowners uh, can access this information easily. If they can't make one of the webinars, they can uh, just watch it later when they have time. Um, and with the background that these volunteers already have, this training is just gonna add to their awesomeness. So we're very excited about our, about our, um, our volunteers. I'll be coordinating the scheduling for the habitat assessments with the landowners and the volunteers. I'll contact each landowner by email and find out what dates and times work best for you guys and then coordinate those dates and times with the volunteers. Uh, your particular assessment might take a half an hour or it could take two hours, depending on how large your property is, um, how many different features it has, how much chatting the landowners do with the volunteers. You know, uh, the volunteers, like I said, are really excited to help uh, you to have the knowledge to enhance your properties. So I expect there will be some really great conversations between the landowners and the volunteers. Hugh and I will be making maps, kind of like this one right here on, on the screen. We'll be uh, making maps uh, of the properties using GIS, which the volunteers will bring with them to the assessment. And the maps also show, you see the red line around the property. So um, that shows uh, the landscape context and the volunteers will be able to use that um, in, in making, um, when they, when they want to give some advice about what to do with the properties. And um, so that's going to be something that we set up ahead of time. Uh, so they'll have them to bring with them. Um, they'll, they'll be walking the, the property with, with the landowner and you guys will be talking about what birds might be using the habitat, um, what the characteristics of the property are, uh, in, in a few minutes, Corey's going to share with us some of the characteristics found in forest and woodland habitats and what birds associate with these characteristics. Um, the volunteers will be filling out a form and recording the data of these characteristics. Uh, they might make recommendations for invasive removal, adding brush piles, noting canopy gaps, what native seeds producing shrubs around the property and things like that. The volunteers will lead the landowners with an information packet with things like the birders dozen so you can learn more on your own about birds that may be on your property. Isn't that pretty? So one of the other things I'll also leave you with is this is our newly created yard sign um, and you can hang it in your yard and it's a thank you from us from the Lime Forest Block Conservation Project team for caring so much about your birds and other wildlife. So hopefully you can put that right in your yard and you can kind of be a spokesperson for Audubon when your friends and family are able to come over again and see it. Uh, so we have uh, quite a few people signed up for habitat assessments. Uh, we have funding to do 15, but if we get more than 15, we are gonna keep going with it. It might be next spring, but um, we, are, we are hoping to really get everybody in. So um, we want to get you on the list. Most of you have corresponded with me already. And um, if you want to get on the list and you're certain you want to have a habitat assessment, just send me your property size and, and the location and we can get started on those maps. Um, and Feel free to contact me with any questions that you have. And I think now we're going to turn it over to Corey and she's going to take us on a virtual tour. Okay. Um, 
so thank you for your great, great description there, Kelly, of the of sort of the sort of more the logistics of how we're going to do these habitat assessments. Um, one thing that would be good is if you can just quickly throw your email address in the chat box, then uh, people will, will have that um, have it available for you them to be able to contact you. Uh, so let me um, share my screen again. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do for the next um, 20 minutes or so is uh, I'd like to take you all on a virtual habitat assessment of the Mine Hill Preserve. Um, the Mine Hill Preserve is a 360 acre property um, in Roxbury, Connecticut. It's owned by the Roxbury Land Trust. Um, but for this virtual assessment, um, and when I actually visited this property, I only explored about 30 acres of it. So the, uh, the parking lot is down at the, the lower end, and I just sort of walked in and kind of explored this sort of lower section of of the property. And uh, you know, while I was there, it was actually about the same time of year, uh, so early spring, and uh, so a lot of our forest nesting birds hadn't arrived yet. So I really focused on looking at the features of this woodland. Um, you know, what characteristics that it, did it have that um, would uh, be good for birds or might be clues to what bird species would be found there in the summer months. And uh, this property, I think, is a good one to sort of talk about because uh, similar to Many of your properties, uh, it's located in a forest IDA. So the Mine Hill Preserve is located in the Shephog Forest Block Important Bird Area, um, which is one of our, our newer important bird areas. And like the Lime Forest Block, it is a landscape scale IDA. So a, a large important bird area that includes um, various uh, protected open spaces, land trust properties, town <laughs> open space, um, but then there are a lot of people that live in the, the Shephog Forest Block as well, similar to the Lime Forest Block. Um, and also one similarity between the two forest blocks is um, in the Shephog Forest Block, we have the Shephog River and then its tributaries, which sort of connects uh, much of the forest block. Uh, similar to how in the Lime Forest Block, we have the Eight Mile River um, and its tributaries that sort of connect um, large areas of the Lime Forest Block. So there's some similarities between these two IBAs. Here's just a, a few pictures um, of the Shephog River on the right and the um, a tributary of the Shephog River on the left. Um, and sort of this would be similar to, you know, the Eight Mile River in the Lime Forest Block and some of its tributaries. And uh, the Shephog Forest Block was identified as an important bird area, um, particularly for Louisiana water thrush. Um, I mean, all those tributaries they create to a lot of great habitat for Louisiana water thrush. Um, like Eileen was saying, this is a bird species that is just starting to show up in Connecticut right now. And uh, their song sort of sounds like, hey, 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 watch where you're going. That's what I, I think they sound like. And uh, then the river itself, the Shephog River, uh, provides a lot of habitat for common mergansers, which are um, a, a duck species that nests along rivers uh, in the summertime. And you often see them on the coast in the wintertime. Like the Lime Forest Block, the, the Shephog Forest Block also provides a variety of habitat for other forest nesting birds. Um, many of these you, you saw in the, uh, in the presentation that Hugh gave, but um, birds like the Eastern Wood Peewee, the Black and White Warbler, the Wood Thrush, Ovenbird, Beery, Black Throated Blue Warbler, and Scarlet Tanninger um, can all be found in the Shephog Forest Block. And uh, you know, when we are doing habitat assessments um, this, you know, this summer or late summer um, on your properties, we are sort of, we are, as Eileen mentioned, we are sort of taking into account um, sort of what the surrounding landscape is and what the context is. Um, so, the, you know, we are thinking about the fact that your properties are part of the Lime Forest Block um, and sort of that that is a, an area with a lot of forest, um, a lot of intact uh, interior forest. And, uh, you know, that was something that we'll be keeping in mind this summer. So when I first visited the Mine Hill Preserve, um, you know, the, I, right away I noticed some of these woodland streams. And uh, uh, another feature that I saw, and this picture isn't necessarily from Mine Hill Preserve, but I did also see a lot of herb overturned trees adjacent to some of those streams. And uh, the streams, um, sort of, and these can be ephemeral, um, so sometimes these streams will dry up in the middle of the summer months. Um, but those streams, in combination with some overturned trees, really are what the key features of, of the Louisiana water thrush territories are or habitat. Um, a lot of the times the Louisiana water thrush will sort of be nesting right at the base of one of those overturned trees, and then they'll be foraging along the river. 
Um, you might hear them saying in their song, hey, 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 watch where you're going. But then they also have a very distinct chip call that is really loud um, that you can hear. As I continued my walk through the Mine Hill Preserve, I wanted to look at the vertical diversity um, or sort of what is the sort of status of the, the canopy, the mid-story and the understory. What trees were there? Um, was the canopy closed? Was it open? Did it have gaps? Uh, what was the mid-story like? What species were there? Same thing for the understory. So uh, it was early spring. Um, there wasn't leaves on the trees yet, which you know a lot of people look at leaves when they're trying to identify a tree. But um, if they're not up in the trees, they're typically down on the ground. So uh, you can kind of figure out what trees are, are in a woodland by just looking at uh, the, the leaves that are that are on the that make up the forest floor and uh, in this particular spot I definitely saw a lot of oak leaves and then uh, I also noticed that there were some beech trees uh, young beech trees uh, like in the top right picture there uh, will actually maintain their leaves during the, the winter months so that makes them fairly easy to identify and then the, the larger beech trees have very smooth bark so that was something I was seeing as well but uh, especially where there are a lot of oak trees you find a lot of scarlet tanagers. So that was a species that I suspected would be found at Mine Hill Preserve. And it was a fairly open, you know, fairly uh, closed canopy as well, um, with just a few gaps. Um, so I thought that would be appropriate for scarlet tanager. And these guys, um, just a reminder, they say they're chick burr, chick burr, uh, which is their call and it's very distinctive. I also took a look at the mid story and uh, there was uh, definitely an evergreen component to the mid-story, uh, lots of hemlocks. And uh, as Hugh pointed out, hemlocks are sort of a favorite, favorite habitat of the black-throated green warbler. Um, so this is a spot, um, especially sort of being located in Northwest Connecticut, uh, where we have a decent number of black-throated green warbler. I, I was very, I thought it was very likely that this um, particular preserve had black-throated green warbler in the summer months. Um, these guys are nesting in the, the hemlocks, but they will kind of go to sort of forest openings or to edges uh, to forage, uh, especially when their they're young have fledged and they're sort of looking for additional food resources. And these guys go zee 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 zoo zee or strangers in the night. And then they also have another call song that's uh, trees, trees, murmuring trees. So those are some things to listen for if you find yourself in a, in a hemlock forest or if you have hemlocks on your property. Then I took a look at the understory, and there was some variability in the understory as I walked Mine Hill Preserve. Uh, there were some areas that were um, maybe a little lower spots um, where the, the, you could see that the soil was a little bit wetter um, and there was a decent amount of vegetation. It's kind of hard to see in the, the lower left-hand picture but because the, there's no leaves on this vegetation, but there's quite a lot of um, sort of stem diversity in the understory here. Um, I also saw areas that were maybe a little bit more higher up on like upland areas um, that had a lot of mountain laurel, um, some young hemlock trees. And uh, I thought those sort of lower areas that were with very fairly dense vegetation would be good habitat for the viri, um, which is a, a ground nester um, that definitely prefers sort of wetter habitats, not, not, not like flooded habitats because they are ground nester and they couldn't necessarily nest in the water, um, but definitely where it's damper, wet, sort of wetter soil or where there's maybe uh, vernal pools nearby. And then uh, the mountain laurel made me think that this could be a spot where you would find black-throated blue warbler. Um, these guys are nesting, um, you know, maybe a foot to three or four feet off the ground, typically in very dense stands of mountain laurel or uh, striped maple as you get further to the north. And I also noticed that there were some canopy gaps. Um, this is, you know, Eileen's picture of a canopy gap with the green leafy trees around it made it a little bit more obvious, but um, on the left side picture here, you are sort of st still seeing a canopy gap. Um, this tree right here, uh, looks like it, it broke off at one point and uh, that's kind of what caused this opening. And uh, there were some cavities in trees that were along the edge of that canopy gap. And then it had a nice sort of dense understory of mountain laurel. And uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, canopy gaps are sort of a really valuable component of a forest because it's a spot where sunlight can get through to the forest floor um, and that will stimulate the growth of, of vegetation in the understory. 
and uh, you get, often get a lot of insects and a lot of berries um, in those canopy gaps. And if, if the canopy gap was formed because maybe one of the, the overstory trees uh, blew over or um, you know, broke, uh, then a lot of times you'll get cavities, you'll get, you know, you'll have snags. And uh, that habitat, you know, be great for things like the eastern wood peewee, um, which will sort of sit on one of these branches and sally out into the, the gap to sort of feed on insects. Um, hairy woodpeckers, other woodpeckers. Um, the eastern wood peewee is actually a cavity nester as well. Um, those will, will take advantage of, of the cavities or, you know, or snags that are found in these areas. And then even species like the scarlet tanager will kind of move um, from the sort of forest interior to these canopy gaps, again, for just the, the resources of insects and, and berries that can be found in canopy gaps. While I was walking around the property, I also was looking, looking at the forest floor. And uh, you can see that there was a lot of leaf litter, so that would be good for things like wood thrush um, and veery. Um, and then there was also a lot of um, large and small woody material. And Eileen talked about this a little bit, and uh, the, the smaller woody material is smaller than your arm, and the larger woody material is sort of larger than your arm. And, uh, you know, having these sort of piles of woody material uh, provides a lot of benefits. Um, first, you have a lot of insects associated with this woody material as it's biodegrading. And then um, lots of birds can kind of use this area for protection. They can be uh, hiding out underneath it or nesting underneath it. And uh, so they're kind of protected from predators. Uh, once I was walking a property and uh, saw a brush pile and happened to look uh, carefully and there was a nest in the brush pile. Um, this isn't that exact nest, but it, it is that species. Um, but this is an oven bird nest. Uh, oven birds make a little oven uh, in the grass and uh, will nest inside there. And uh, that's what an oven bird looks like. And uh, these guys are a pretty common forest nesting bird. Uh, they definitely like to have an understory. They like to have a uh, woody material on the forest floor. Um, and they sound like teacher, 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 teacher. And uh, brush piles are also good because, um, you know, they are a spot. If you have a lot of, of brush, if you have some downed woody material, um, that actually also provides protection uh, for young saplings from deer browse. So, um, you know, as Eileen mentioned, we do have a lot of deer in Connecticut. Um, a lot of the times you'll sort of see, um, you know, saplings or seedlings that have been sort of the tips of tops have been nipped off. Um, but where you have a lot of downed woody material, um, not only does that provide protection for birds, but it also provides protection for, for seedlings and saplings, uh, the next generation of our forest. Uh, this was another thing I noticed um, when I was walking Mine Hill property. Uh, there were some pileated woodpecker holes. So there's our pileated woodpecker. Um, the pileated, you heard it, it's call earlier in the presentation, but their um, they're sort of markings um, or where they've been foraging are typically these very uh, long um, oval-shaped uh, holes. So they're, they're pretty distinctive and oftentimes you see a lot of wood chips at the base as well. Um, so when you see this, you know that there's a pileated woodpecker somewhere in the area. They have pretty large territories. Um, uh, so that you may not necessarily see them at any given time, but uh, if you've got large trees, and especially if you're sort of seeing these drilling holes, um, then you know that there's a pileated woodpecker that sort of is visiting your, your property or the area you're walking. Well, one other feature that I want to sort of mention um, from my walk at Mine Hill Preserve is invasive plants. And uh, I know this got hit on a little bit earlier in the presentation. Um, but I wanted to explain a little bit more about what invasive plants are. So these are species that are not native to, um, you know, definitively not native to Connecticut, um, and most of the time not native to North America. Um, they're species that might be from Asia or Europe. Um, and the, when they, they may get to the United States, um, or may have been here for many, many years, um, but they could have been brought over with um, cargo from ships, um, you know, that sometimes they are brought over as sort of part of the horticulture trade. Uh, but when they are planted in, in Connecticut um, or, or the Northeast, uh, they, it's a species that tends to do really well because uh, the predators that it would normally have, the sort of uh, insects and things that would normally feed on that plant, aren't present. Um, you know, if you bring a, a plant like in the uh, top right corner there, 
Uh, actually, let me put some veg some leaves on these plants. There we go. So we've got Japanese barberry in the top right there. Um, so in Japan, there are insects that feed on Japanese barberry. There are various other animals that are adapted to eat this plant. But when you bring it to Connecticut, there is not insects, you know, or very few insects um, or caterpillars that are adapted to, to eat Japanese barberry. So the, the invasive plants can really grow uh, unchecked. And, um, you know, since these, you know, if you have a forest that has a lot of, say, Japanese barberry in the understory or you know, there's lots of wing geonimus or wineberry. Um, you know, because these species are not eat, eaten by certain insects or caterpillars, then you actually have less insects and caterpillars, um, you know, within that forest. And uh, for birds, especially songbirds, insects make up a huge percentage of their diet in the summer months, and particularly when they're feeding nestlings. So if you have a lot of invasive plants and you don't have as very many native plants, then um, you just don't have as much insects and caterpillars for birds to be able to eat and feed their young. So one thing, uh, here's a few more actually. Now I wanted to, these are actually from my backyard and I took these pictures uh, two days ago, but I wanted to you know, show you a few of the invasive plants um, that you can see right now because um, this is actually a great time of year to sort of recognize invasive plants um, and also to, to try to do some management of them because uh, frequently um, invasive plants actually leap out before the native plants do. So um, kind of going back a slide, you know, the winged euonymus, the wineberry, the black Japanese barberry, they will get their leaves before our native shrubs. Um, and garlic mustard, I can testify, is coming up right now, um, as is multiflora rose is, is coming, um, is, is starting to leaf out. Uh, the ornamental bittersweet isn't quite leafing out yet, but I wanted to sort of show a picture of that because uh, this is a vine that can really climb up trees and cause a lot of damage to it. But if it, when it's little, if you pull it up, you know you pulled up the right plant because it has very orange roots. Um, so I've been, I've been working on pulling up ornamental bittersweet in my yard. Uh, so this is actually a great time of year to be sort of looking for invasive plants in your yard to sort of get a sense for, you know, on your property, you know, how many, you know, what species you have, um, where they're found. Um, and maybe you can do a little bit of management. Um, so maybe you can get a head start on, on sort of managing your woodlands for birds and other wildlife. Uh, some tools of the trade, I would say bring gloves if you're going to try to do some invasive plant management this spring. Um, because, uh, you know, you're maybe pulling up an invasive plant, but without the leaves on, on other native vegetation, such as poison ivy, you know, um, you, you just want to make sure you're, you're kind of protecting yourself. Um, and then, um, you know, you can maybe pull up some plants, but you might need clippers to sort of cut back other plants. Um, so those are a good thing to have as well. And so if you're walking around your property, um, you can hand pull uh, annuals like garlic mustard, um, and maybe some small shrubs so, or, or vines like uh, young ornamental bittersweet plants, young multiflora rose plants, young Japanese barberry. Uh, as those shrubs or vines get larger, then maybe using your clippers would probably be effective. And you could sort of cut uh, ornamental bittersweet vines that are climbing up your trees, um, you know, cut back uh, multiflora rose, Japanese barberry. Uh, these plants will re-sprout, but if you continuously cut them, you know, over the season or over a few years, you will eventually sort of use up all of the energy that are in the roots and they will eventually sort of die off. And then, uh, as Eileen mentioned, you know, we, we recommend a phased approach. Um, so, you know, kind of take, a, sort of assess how many invasives that you have, what species, and then choose an area to work on um, to sort of re to try to remove those. And if you can, uh, replace them with native plants. Um, one species that does really well um, in the woods is the spice bush. And uh, this is what it looks like right now. Um, so you'll see, you know, clean, you know, twigs without any leaves, but little yellow flowers. Um, and spice bush is a, a great plant for the understory of our forests um, because it does tolerate shade fairly, fairly well. Um, it uh, is the host plant for the spice bush swallowtail, which is one of our larger butterflies. Um, so you hopefully will get some more butterflies in your, on your property, but then also, um, you know, they're, they're bird food too. And then um, it produces red berries in the fall, which are going to be great food for scarlet canningers, red-eyed vireos. American robins, and a variety of other birds. 
So uh, again, I just want to, you know, give a few overall tips for managing your properties with birds in mind. Um, you know, these are, would be some, uh, you know, tips that I you know, gave to the Roxbury Land Trust, but then you might also be able to use on your own property. Um, so plant native vegetation that provides fruit, seeds, nectar, and insects for birds to eat year round. Uh, maintain and encourage a mix of deciduous and coniferous trees if you can. Um, you know, just adding a few conifers uh, is a, it can be a, a nice addition to a, to a, a property. Um, conifers protect um, birds from the elements and predators in the winter months, um, so they, they are kind of a nice addition if you, if you have space to add a few trees. Uh, along woodland edges, um, you want to have sort of soft edges. You want to encourage growth of vegetation of varying heights, uh, from grasses and wildflowers to small shrubs to larger shrubs to small trees, because um, that creates a variety of habitats that birds can use and also um, sort of protects forest interior birds from things like cowbirds and predators. And then um, if you can, promote a dense understory and midstory of native trees and shrubs that provide nesting and foraging habitat for species like the wood thrush and red-eyed vireo. And uh, this is a website that Audubon um, has that is actually really great if you're looking to plant uh, native plants, whether it's trees or shrubs or perennials. Uh, it's our Plants for Birds website. So if you just go to audubon.org slash plants for birds. Um, on this website, you can just type in your zip code and it will give you a list of um, plants that are, you know, have benefits to birds and other wildlife. Um, and then you can sort them by, by, you know, maybe if you're interested in just planting shrubs, you can say, just show me the shrubs. Um, if you're interested in planting trees, you can say, just show me the trees. If you want to plant plants that would attract hummingbirds. Um, so if you live in a, a fairly uh, a, a wooded area that has some wetlands, um, or sort of wet forest. That's where you typically have hummingbirds nesting. Um, you know, if you have an area like that near you, um, you know, you can maybe attract some of those hummingbirds to your property if you pr pr plant particular plants that hummingbirds tend to really love. Uh, so that's a great website to check out if you haven't already. And then just a few more tips. Um, you know, I think probably through this presentation, you're kind of understanding how um, snags and down deadwood are, are really valuable to uh, birds as nesting places um, as sort of protection and then also um, places where they can find food. Uh, definitely um, start learning your invasive plant species um, and sort of think about how you might be able to, to monitor and control them. Uh, if you can, promote a diversity of forest age classes. Um, as Eileen mentioned early on, having some areas with young forest, um, some areas with uh, slightly older forest, some areas with middle-aged forest, some areas with with at least forest that has the feature of an old, older growth forest um, is really great if you've got the space. And then, um, you know, keep forest interiors intact um, by avoiding subdividing forest, constructing new roads or, or trails that are larger than, than 40 feet wide, um, and keep, um, you know, new buildings close to sort of existing roads. So that uh, concludes our, our virtual habitat assessment um, and also uh, concludes our presentation uh, for today, uh, but we are all glad to stay on the, uh, the call for a little bit longer to, to ask questions, to take questions, and uh, I want to just uh, thank everybody for participating today, and uh, thank Eileen and Kelly and Hugh for, for their parts of the presentation. Um, this is, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Corey. You're welcome, Eileen. Thank you. There was a, a question in the chat box about uh, whether there are cost effective ways to fence out deer and prevent deer browse. Um, there are lots of ways you can fence out deer. Um, the cost effective part, I think, is the challenge. I think it's, I mean, so there, there are people out there who put big giant fences around their entire yards or their entire property. And, you know, if you've just got an, uh, a few acres, that might be doable, um, you know, but if you've got 25, 30 acres, that might be a, a larger cost. Um, an alternative would be to fence just, you know, if you're planting shrubs or planting trees that, you know, you really want to be able to um, sort of survive deer browse, putting fencing just around those trees, um, especially for the first few years as they're getting established, would be a way to sort of go about doing that. Now, why do you think that?
Okay. Any other questions? Now, do you have a couple other species besides spice bush? Is that something that we can actually acquire locally? I believe so. Uh, on our Lime Forest Black Conservation page website, we actually have a list of local nurseries that have native plants. Um, so you can go take a look at that. If you Google Lime Forest Black Conservation Project, that website will come up. And uh, there's definitely a list of nurseries there. Uh, spice bush is a good one. Um, you know, mountain laurel in some areas, uh, witch hazel. Uh, Eileen, if you think of other other plants, uh, blueberries, huckleberries, they mm -hmm. tend to do, those two species tend to do better where there's some light. They'll, they'll do, they will live in the sort of shot in the shade of, of a sort of a, a closed canopy, but they um, produce a lot more berries when there's sunlight getting down. Through. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. You mentioned um, blackberries, I think in a positive light, but are black, blackberries also, do they take over and what do you think about blackberries? Well, blackberries um, are native, uh, you know, or, you know, various black raspberry, blackberries, there's a lot of different species of blackberry, um, but they are native species. Um, they do produce a lot of, you know, they do produce food for birds. Uh, I think that the, you know, they, they can get dense, um, but if, you know, if we're looking at a patch that's sort of back in the woods, I don't really see that as being a, an issue. Um, you know, maybe if you, you know, had an area where maybe kids were playing in your yard, you wouldn't want necessarily a big blackberry stand, but um, for oh, they're bird, bird wise, they're definitely a good plant. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Perry, I, I think I was the one that mentioned blackberries in a positive light, and I was definitely talking about a clearing in the forest. You know, um, I, I would echo what Corey said. Hmm. How about um, we have a brook that comes down from the land trust property. Uh, we have beavers there now, which is pretty cool. And um, I'd like to clear some of the real, there's, there's a lot of thorny, nasty stuff right by the brook. I want to leave it alone on the other side, but have it a little clear by our property so we can actually do some more observation. Is that damaging as long as it's, I sure, I'm sure that during our uh, assessment we can talk about it, but uh, is that really a damaging thing to do to clear it a bit so that we can actually see what's going on near the brook? I think, and I mean, you give me your two cents too. Uh, I would think that clearing a small area um, so you can sort of access and see see the brook better is okay. Um, you might want to maintain maybe some lower vegetation right along the edge just so that, um, just to prevent erosion. Mm. Okay. Yeah, Great. my... Um, my years in a watershed association are clamoring in my head here. Uh, the, the bit about having some vegetation uh, all the way down to the, the water's edge is, is really important. But I'm with Corey. I think if you're clearing a small area to give yourself access to the brook, the benefits of that outweigh whatever little interruption you have in the vegetation, if you're going down there to actually see what's there and make decisions about how to manage your property and appreciate, uh, appreciate what you have living on the property. Um, like I said earlier, um, we want people to enjoy the original reasons for having the property. Um, and as long as you just keep in mind that uh, some vegetation along the, the water's edge is uh, is beneficial for water quality and preventing erosion. That's great. We're, we're trying to we're trying to eradicate the invasive species that seem to like the brook. <laughs> yeah. So that, that is a tough one. Uh, yeah, there's another question. Um, you know, like wild grapes. I mean, uh, are they invasive? Are they native? They they seem to love to pull the trees down. They seem to love and they, they like to grow right in the brook. So we pulled them out because they were clogging the brook. Mm -hmm. uh, which wasn't so great. Yeah. Uh, well, again, if you have multiple multiple purposes for your property, you do need to make some some judgment calls there. Wild grape is native, and uh, you know it's beneficial for uh, local wildlife. Downed wood in a brook is is actually good for some of the things that live in brooks. But if you have abundant abundant wild grape and it's <laughs> it's killing some of the native trees on your property. Um, it's, it's not like the, uh, 
the bird habitat police are going to come and give you a hard time for that, for clearing out a little bit of the grape. Yeah, it's, it, it tends to like to take over. So we've cleared it out of the brook anyway. It grows just fine on the rest of the property. On the other side of the brook, it's yeah. having a good old time, but we did take some of it out because it was just, whew, okay, yeah. But thank you, that, you know, at least it, we know it's not gonna be a terribly detrimental thing as long as we don't try to eradicate all of it. Bittersweet, on the other hand, is the devil weed. So <laughs> I, I, I'm a bittersweet, um, Avenger. <laughs> we need all of those we can get. Oh, crazy <laughs> stuff. Don't ever bring it to your house and use it as a display ornament for Christmas. That was a big mistake. Did it once. Ooh, bad. Been on your property ever since? Absolutely. Mm. <laughs> so it doesn't take much, I can tell you that. It just takes a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you get a big mess. But so far, we're, we're winning. Congratulations. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, you know, one thing with invasive management, um, and I'm going to just sort of stress what Eileen said about a phased approach, and um, is that invasives can be overwhelming. So um, one strategy is, you know, if there are areas where you have just a few invasives, you want to keep it that way. You want to try to, and, and try to clear out the invasives in those areas. If you have large areas with, with large numbers of invasive plants, you want to make sure those areas don't spread. So you want to really maintain the, uh, the borders or the edges of those areas. And by maintain the border, I mean, uh, it's like that's your, uh, it's your, your fighting line, you know, so you don't let the invasives get beyond, you know, out of that area and into another area. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you've got um, you know, time and potentially funds to sort of tackle a larger area like that, then you pick a section of it and, and clear the invasives, replace with natives, um, and then you got to keep on it for a while, um, you know, make sure that those, um, you know, kind of go back and check and see if any of those invasives are coming back. And if so, you know, pull them out or cut them back again. Um, you know, it is, you really want to do take a phased approach because it, it can be overwhelming. So um, for, focus on little, on areas with few natives first, hold, hold the border lines with large areas with larger invasives, and then work on those areas and sections. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. I told them. One person just mentioned uh, in the chat that birds can spread invasives by eating their seeds. Um, so perhaps cut when they are blooming before they, they produce berries. And that is definitely true. Um, you know, there, um, there is an invasive plant working group in Connecticut or SIPWIC. It's the Connecticut Invasive, yes, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group. And they have a website. Um, and if you go on there, they have something called the Invasive Calendar. And, uh, and you can look at when is the best time of year to manage particular invasive species. And uh, some of them you do want to, you know, you can, you can manage, if you manage them, you know, if you're kind of conscious that they're there on your property, um, you, you know, one thing to think about is not letting them go to seed. So um, sort of, you know, maybe go through and cut the flowers off or cut, you know, cut the, you know, what looks like it's going to be a flower or a berry at some point, cut those off um, before they actually go fully to seed or to fruit um, and put those, those cut, those cuttings into a garbage bag and get them off your property. Um, so that would be, that's something you can do. And where's the invasive calendar? I'm sorry, I missed that. So it's on, it's on, so SIPWIC. Eileen, do you know exactly what SIPWIC stands for? You're on mute. That's because my dog is barking. <laughs> um, is the Connecticut Invasive Plants Working Group or working something that ends with a C? Yeah, working group. Yeah. Connecticut invasive, invasive Plants Working Group, okay. Uh, let me see. There might be a link to it on the Line Forest Block page. Let me just check really quick. Well, it's definitely not the Central Illinois Pro Wrestling Club, which is what just came up on. <laughs> uh, I'll keep looking. Oh, oh, just, it's, on, it's, on the, it's on the Lime Forest Black <laughs> Conservation Project page. So oh, okay. if you, you know, Google Lime Forest Black Conservation Project and scroll down about a third of the way down, um, there's a, a spot where you can click on it. It's on the sort of right-hand side of the screen. Yeah, it's uh, tipwig.ucon.edu. 
cipwg.ucon.edu. Excellent. Of course, my best buddy, who is an Ace Granby um, invasive fighter from way back, probably knows this already. But if she doesn't, I can share that with her too. <laughs> she gets yeah. really dirty and muddy on a, on a regular basis. And uh, one thing I just want to mention, we didn't really unplug um, it too much during the presentation, but our, our Lime Forest Black Conservation Project website, and I will just drop the URL into the chat box right now. Um, it, there's a, we have really worked to try to put a lot of great resources on that webpage. Um, like I mentioned, there's um, a list of uh, uh, nurseries that sell native plants. Um, you can get a link to the, the SIPWIC uh, website. Um, there's a link to the, the Native Plants for Birds website. Um, there's a, a map of the line, an interactive map of the line forest block that you can go in and, and look at and you can sort of think about, you know, sort of see where your property fix, fits in the landscape. Um, so a, really a lot of great resources there and we're just going to be adding so many more resources over the spring uh, you know, as we're sort of training volunteers. Um, so definitely something to check out and, and kind of come back to periodically. You, you guys know about the Mabel Norman Bird Sanctuary in Middletown, Rhode Island, right? I that don't. Is, no, that is an Audubon site, I believe, and it was one of my great, 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 um, I don't know, grandmother's aunt something, who donated the property. There's 350 acres, and uh, I wish I could go now, but I think that Rhode Island is kind of stopping us at the border because we're ter terribly infectious, but it's a terrific, um, it's a terrific resource. It's called the Norman Bird Sanctuary Museum. So if anybody gets a chance to go, it's a same bird sanctuary, nature preserve, and environmental education center. In 1949, it was founded through a bequest in the will of Mabel Norman Serio. She met a man in, uh, in the Isle of Capri, Italy, which we visited a couple of years ago. And I didn't know about her until my sister did the genealogy and told us about her. So it's really kind of interesting. Yeah. I'm like full circle coming around. Yeah. Good. Cool. Yeah. Sometimes you get a, a blank look from people when uh, who work for National Audubon when you say, "Surely you know about this Audubon sanctuary," um, and that's because there are independent nonprofit organizations in the in many states that are also mm -hmm. called Audubon societies. So that may very well be a property of the Rhode Island Audubon Society, which mm -hmm. is which is independent of National Audubon. So um, I, I, it's a complicated topic that I don't want to spend a lot of time on right now, but just, just so you know, Audubon does not always mean the same organization. <laughs> you, need to, you need to check and see which Audubon it is. But that's a great, uh, that's a great tip. Thank you very much. Oh, one little thing to note there too is, is even though there, there's a lot of different organizations that are an Audubon of some sort or another, we do actually work together on a lot of things too. So, oh yeah. Um, there's a, a lot of camaraderie among Audubon is organizations as well. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and a lot of people who are veterans of several different Audubons. Yep. Thanks so much for all the resources. This is great. We'll be You're able welcome. to explore more. I know we have at least six of the species that Hugh had spoken so eloquently about in our property uh, right now. So we're hoping we can encourage more, um, more of that as we go. Awesome. Yeah. Well, great. There's acres here. We might as well, 6.5 acres, we might as well, you know, make sure that it, it invites the habitat or it provides the habitat for those species that we want to preserve and encourage in the state. Because we're so lucky to have so many beautiful species of birds and, and butterflies and just Connecticut's a lovely state. It just yeah. provides so much. So. Yeah, I know we're we're really lucky that I mean I think it's fifty nine percent of the state is is either woodland or forest, um, you know, at this time. And you know, there's a lot of great conservation groups out there, lots of land trusts that are working to protect properties. And if private landowners are are helping up helping as well by sort of just taking care of their the lands that they own, um, you know, we really do have some incredible resources for birds wildlife and people too. It's great because the land trust is right across the street that 
Oakley Hill Preserve is the reason that we got involved, you know? Yay! <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's been a, a terrific thing and we're just, it, it's just very exciting, you know, and it's, yeah. it just feels really good to, to help to preserve this. It, it's very important. It was important to me as a child. My father was honored by the Audubon uh, Society in his area at one point because he did a lot of extensive work to keep yeah. forests. Uh, yeah, healthy. you might think Ragged Hill Woods, yeah, there's a bench there with his plaque dedicated to Hilliard House Smith. So I know that he's up there smiling and saying, that's my girl. Ever since I sat out there by the bird feeder, held my hand out and had little chickadees landing on it. Uh, he, uh, he'd be very happy. I'm sure he's happy to see this. Mm -hmm. so, but we'll continue. We'll just do our best to help. Great. Yeah, so welcome. thank you, everybody. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. Really appreciate the the participation. It's a good way to spend the morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, um, go ahead, Eileen. I, I just wanted to, to throw in, um, you know, much as we are very enthusiastic about uh, our work, we are not the only ones saying this. Um, there are, there's the Connecticut Forest and Park Association, there, there are various watershed associations, other conservation organizations, folks at the Connecticut DEP, uh, various programs, um, they all have some resources about this topic. So uh, while uh, we'd, we'd love to stay in touch with all of you and uh, keep on interacting, just, just wanna mention that there's a wealth of other resources too that we'd, we'd be glad to uh, help you find as, as we go along together in this. Okay, I'm done, Corey. Okay, well, I, I think we are, unless if anybody has any last questions, um, and I'll give 10 seconds to see if we got any last questions, but otherwise, I think we will, we will call it a day. Um, any questions? Okay, uh, well, I just want to thank everybody again for, for joining, and, and thank you, Eileen and Hugh and Kelly, for your, your excellent presentations, and uh, uh, this is going to go up on our website, so if anybody wants to go back and watch parts of this recording again, um, or um, if you know somebody else who's interested in a habitat assessment and they weren't able to make this presentation, um, we will get this up on the, the Lime Forest Black website uh, probably in the next week so that people can, can kind of tune, can watch it again if they want. So thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank, thank you, Corey. Thanks, thank you everybody. Bye-bye, all. Thank you very much. You're welcome. No, I don't get it.